Good afternoon. Welcome to Ask Me Anything, which is where um, we try and answer all the questions that um, you, our audience, send in to YouTube, to Instagram, um, and to any other social media platforms where we find interesting questions. Um, with me today, I'm joined by Mima Viglezio, who's the editor of Show Studio, and Callum Knight, who's my son, as well as working with me at Show Studio. Um, so, um, let's just launch in. Some of these questions, I mean, just to be totally frank right from the beginning, some of these questions are just hard to answer because we simply don't have answers to some things, but we'll try. So the first one comes from somebody, um, it actually came up after the last AMA, Ask Me Anything, um, where somebody called Zachary Jones wrote, um, I'll read you their uh, question to us or their comment to us. So Zachary exactly. wrote, I'm sort of disappointed on your answer about diversity. It seemed defensive and not very willing to admit Show Studios' panel shortcomings considered, considering diversity. You said it yourself, fashion is political. Fashion has social, cultural and political implications that are experienced differently by people of different ethnic backgrounds different gender identities, different nationalities, different social classes, etc. Saying you don't seek out people by their ethnicity, just by their potential contribution to discussions is actually the issue. Fashion circles in London are probably majority white, so you actually do have to seek out people by their, by their non-white ethnicity. If you do want more guests of colour and hopefully more rich conversations, um, you seem to understand the volume of comments asking for more diversity. We want to see ourselves in the panels. We want to hear what a non-typical fashion person has to say. These dozens of white women, white women are beginning to blend together. Brackets, except Mima, of course. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, so, Zachary, I'll, I'll try and answer that as best I can and honestly I can. Uh, I'm sorry if I sounded defensive when I was answering your question last time or any question can, uh, pertaining to diversity. Um, I think it's... it's to be raised really totally honest with you, it's probably a natural reaction when you perhaps you feel you haven't done well as you should have done, to when you will feel slightly attacked for that. Um, sometimes you do get a bit defensive, and I, um, I do have my apologies if I was defensive, but it was probably for the very reason that, yes, I would like to make the panels more diverse. Yes, to some degree, I agree with you, but we failed in that. Um, and of course, we are trying to rectify it all the time. Um, so I'm, I'm, I really wanted to say, you know, the, there is no, uh, obviously there's no agenda to keep the panels of, of one ethnic type. We want to have them as diverse as possible. And the reason to do the panels and why we started doing the panels is to say fashion has a very broad range of opinion from all sorts of people, from buyers to journalists to models to photographers to designers. There are lots of different people that express opinions on fashion. Um, we wanted to get that broad um, sense of that. Um, and that's what we've been trying to do. So, of course, you know, in the premise of the panels, we are really open to having a wide range of people. Um, we, we do contact lots of people, and as Mima said to me the other day, you know, it's not just getting people for, to, so, so you come on a Prada panel or come and talk about Walter van Buridong, they also have to be free at 2.30 on a particular afternoon. Exactly. And we approach, how many would you say, Mima, per panel? Well, when we're lucky, we approach four and they're all available, mm. but sometimes we have to approach 16. And then sometimes someone pulls out two hours before. So, it's so you know, it, 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 you know, with, with all with all best will in the world, you know, guests do drop out, you know, half an hour, an hour, two hours before the panel themselves, and we have to fill our spaces. Um, hopefully, you'll see by watching our panels historically that there is now many more people of colour on the panels and a broader range of opinions. So that's obviously what we aim to try and do, and we will keep on doing that. Um, so I, I don't know if there's anything more to add to that. It was really to sort of say, I'm sorry if I was defensive, it's probably quite natural I was, because I don't feel I've done a good enough job, but I shouldn't be, I shouldn't respond aggressively. And to be even more truthful, I do often get told that when I'm asked questions, I can respond aggressively, <laughs> which is unfortunately just my speech patterns, but it's not meant that way. I also think it's important to note that whilst the panels are a huge amount of what we do, Show Studio is a platform, not a publication. And in that any time that anyone is invited or comes to us with a new piece of work, whether that be a fashion film, a best in show, a show talk, a, or even a fashion illustration, they are having a voice. And if you look at all of our contributors across the season, across the year, across the 18 years of Show Studio, I do believe that it has been very diverse. However, our panels get the most attention due to the fact it's five people sitting there visibly. And that is, of course, where we need to work on it. Can I just add one? Mm, of course. That we are in the process of inviting people for our panels that start on the 6th of January right now, and we are taking this even more into account. Mm. It's not always easy, as uh, Nick was saying, some people are not available, and sometimes the ones we really want are not available. 
but be reassured we are keeping this in mind more than ever. I mean, I've said it to, to, to people here in, in the past, I would love, you know, I don't know what you do Zachary I'm afraid, but I would love people to come and volunteer to be on a panel. Yes. I'm absolutely up for hearing from anybody, whatever profession, if they've got an opinion and some wisdom to impart about a particular brand. You know, you, you can be a fisherman from Grimsby, but it doesn't mean you're not interested mm. in Walter Van Berendonck or Calvin Klein or whatever it is. Your profession doesn't mean that you, if you're not, if you are not employed in the fashion industry, does not mean you won't have opinions about it. So I'd be very happy to hear from people from all over the country, all over the world, but probably more likely all over the country, um, to, you know, to, to volunteer to come on our panels. So this goes out to everybody. If you want to be considered for one of the show studio panels, please write to us. There's a contact uh, email at info. the bottom of the site. Is that right? Info at showstudio.com. So info at showstudio.com and just apply. Tell us who you are and then you'll be absolutely eligible for it. Okay. Well, I hope that deals fairly and undefensively with your question, but it's taken on board. Right. Um, that's one. That's moving on. These are in no particular order, so I don't want to come to that next. Um, oh, this was one about a best in show, about uh, a chap called Jordan Vickers, who's a friend and uh, somebody who's been in films on show studio, we used to work at Machine Out, with which we are associated. Um, somebody wrote about Jordan, just another, oh, and he was doing a best in show. And the idea of a best in show is um, that uh, people, a whole, again, a whole range of different people from all different parts of the industry, um, pick out their favorite piece of clothing from that season. Anyways, we did one with the lovely Jordan Vickers, and somebody who is called Whatever, um, <laughs> I'm not being rude, that's what they're- <laughs> It's called Whatever, yeah. It's yeah. called Whatever. <laughs> Um, wrote, just another social influencer, give it a chance, because there's nothing insightful to say, but he touched on the piece or concept, stick to fit picks G. Well, so I... Stick to fit picks I think it was stick to being Taking photos of your outfit. Oh, no. okay, sorry. Um, so I commissioned the series of Best in Show, which three of which are out, and another six or more are coming out in the next few weeks. And Best in Show, actually, having been involved in lots of the different bits of content that we do, is one of the more intimidating ones because you're not on a panel having a discussion, you're not there talking about your own work, you're talking about what inspires you and also your preferences and what you like and actually that's quite hard. Alone so, in front of a camera. And you're in front of a camera, <laughs> there's no one else, it's no. just you or, and some clothes. Um, I thought Jordan has an extreme insight into what he was speaking about and also he is an influencer because people want to hear his opinion but obviously that you know, if you put yourself out on a platform, that's what we're saying about the panels. You have people get scared, and people don't want to nest, and people are nervous, and because they get taken down in the comments. So, I also little. say, sorry, no, okay. not everybody is loved by everybody. No. So we will always have positive comments on yeah. someone and negative comment on the same person. So unless the person really did something wrong, it's subjective, and you know. Yeah. It, I mean, the whole thing about best in show again is I wanted to get a whole range of opinions from lots of different people. Um, part of the problem with fashion is its narrowness in many different respects, and you only hear from a few people. Um, you know, the Susie Menkes, Tim Blanks, who are great, fantastic authorities, Alex Fury, etc. They're all fantastic authorities on fashion, but they are not everybody in fashion. Mm -hmm. And other people have very good and very valid opinions. And I think those opinions can be just the kid who saves up money so he can buy a bit of Gosh Rupchinsky or you know, a bit of uh, Raph Simmons or whatever. He will love that piece of clothing more than anybody else could save up all his, him or her will save all their money just to buy that. They're perfectly valid to stand in front of a camera and say why they like the piece of clothing they've saved up all their money for. Might be still want to resell it, or, but that doesn't really matter. So we try and get a really broad range of people for best in show. One of the sorts of people I would really like to get, which are actually proving quite hard to get our hands on, are people who really make the clothes. So the people who, you know, if, if Prada wants to launch a new bonded silk and rubber dress, somebody has to work out how to do that. And so there will be people who work as pattern cutters or people who work on the um, factory floors or wherever it is who actually make the garments. I'm really interested to hear for them what their best piece was, because there's a certain amount of, of craftsman-like Pride yeah. and that research, goes scientific the, research. Yeah, and that, that, that goes into making a piece of clothing. Um, and I'd be really interested to hear from a pattern cutter or or somebody who's you know responsible for actually bringing some of these new techniques that fashion is 
almost constantly inventing, you know, to making this happen. That must be a moment of pride. So anyway, the best in show is about that. So I would absolutely stick up for Jordan Vickers. He is somebody who's got opinions. You know, he was flown across to Calabasas by Kanye West to give his opinions. You know, this is somebody who's actually got relevance to, to say. And you know what, if he, if he had nobody following him, if he had no followers whatsoever, I'd still want to hear from him if he believed that that piece of clothing was the most important and most exciting for him, thing for him that season. I hope I don't sound aggressively defensive. Um, let's see if I can answer this. This is from And Andre Felix Studio. Um, and he writes, I understand that you, Nick, are not about making money with Chef Studio and that you and that you do have clients that help pay for your creative time one way or another. Um, we have to pay the bills just to live in this world. You can't just drop out and stop paying your way. The question of payments is about others that see value in your work. This then helps to make your way in the world. I I am not doing what I love to do for free. I place value on it. I do believe that Show Studio is helping to bring discussion to us all, new journalists, even if we are just photographing one at one, at one time. I think that came from the last Ask Me Anything, where I probably answered something about money and whether that I thought that work should not just be made for money. Um, I get what you're saying. Um, however, um, I think there's, there's two ways to look at this question. I don't think everything creative that should be made should be made solely to make money. I don't think that I want to produce all the work in my lifetime merely to sell another pair of trainers or a new perfume or a mascara or somebody's collection. And I have no problem doing that and I have no problem seeing where I fit into the economic equation of that. However, I don't want to make all my work just to make money um, or even with money in part of the equation. So I'm suspicious of the deforming influence of money on creativity. Um, it would be interesting, and I may propose this in a slightly absurd way, uh, it would be interesting to say to all artists, you get paid £50 for your piece of work, whatever it is, whoever you are, whether you're Richard Prince, Damien Hirst, Tracy Emin, or somebody just graduating from a college, you only get paid £50 for your piece of work, and then see who's still making work, um, myself included. <laughs> I don't think that's even remotely realistic, but it is quite a nice thought. And My point is just to say, everything seems to be done for money, and Show Studio wasn't started for money. Of course, it has to become a business to continue, et cetera, et cetera. And now, 18 years down the road, we're trying to find ways of financing it and making it work for those sorts of things. But it wasn't started as that. It didn't start back in the year 2000 of me thinking, oh, how can I make a quick million on the internet? Um, it was started as a platform for, for the love of the art. So I guess that's what I was trying to say. And I don't know if that answers your questions, but I know you're, you're, I can feel you're wanting to, 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 to uh, say something. But, but just to say, you know, I, I also, also understand where money fits into to, to what we do. If I'm working for a large cosmetics company, for instance, for somebody making mascaras or for face creams, you know, my image sells those white creams and gives them character and gives them um, some sort of uh, personality. Um, and that brings, brings those companies billions of pounds in. So I recognise that in that equation, how much I should get paid. Yeah. So, but you know, but we do so many things for no money. We do so many things which we pay to do because we believe in them. But I understand your point about money. Of course, money, money tends to make you feel that your work has value. I think in terms of money and show studio, so something that I work on a lot and Mima work on a lot, we talk about is how to finance this kind of platform. But the problem is with money in terms of fashion journalism and fashion communications is that it's actually kind of used as hush money to buy off different opinions, um, opinions basically. And that's the one thing that where money can get really problematic and that we will avoid doing because it's just this is a platform and it's for freedom of speech about the arts not just fashion about any art that we choose to turn our attention to and that's where the line draws and it's very hard to find people who you can work with who, do, who actually want honest opinion but we are trying to do both that's, sorry. that's why we're quite proud of our panel and mm. discussions and all our series being free of sponsors because they they happen to be probably the, not the only but among the only real editorial where people are allowed to say whatever they want to. Well, we, we are free of advertising. I, I just to be careful on the sponsorship word because mm. we do allow people to sponsor things. But not the, not the panel. Not the I was saying the, the panel and the series. Right. The panel, yeah. no, we, we That's what I was saying, yeah. We're but free we, of advertising. We don't keep advertising. It's very hard if you carry a big ad by somebody like Armani or Prada who pay a lot of money for that advertising space, they of course then feel they have some say in what goes into that space they're advertising. And that's the dilemma magazines get yes. caught on. If a large advertiser who's 
taking out the first six pages of the magazine um, doesn't feel like represented well in the editorial well of the magazine, they then uh, exert a, a very huge amount of pressure on that magazine to include their clothing. And we wanted to do something which didn't go down that line at all, which wasn't, we weren't under that pressure to include clothing mm. or to include people or to not include clothing or not include people mm. that advertisers might feel were not correct for their brands. So that's why we don't accept advertising. We accept sponsorship in different ways, but not advertising. And we do create content that is paid for a brand, but that's for the brand. It's yeah. not made yeah. on not purpose for show studio because, of course, we have to survive somehow. So. <laughs> okay, so I hope that makes some sense. Um, the tricky, is it? tricky in and outs of finances yes. <laughs> in the creative industry. Um, so this is referring, this next question comes from somebody called it's underscore uh, Marni, M-A-R-N-I-E, um, referring to a painting um, by Bex Cassie. It might, might be behind me, I'm sure they can see, yeah. you can see on the camera here, or yeah. not. Um, but this one, if you can't. Um, and they've written, female presenting nipples, this wouldn't be allowed on Tumblr which I guess deals with the kind of ridiculous state yeah. that's going to happen to Tumblr. Tumblr has been one of the greater platforms which has allowed people from all manner of different sexual uh, uh, orientations Orientation. and communities to express themselves, etc., etc. Now, Tumblr have fallen the way that Instagram have fallen, um, which is to sort of uh, apply this ridiculous false morality and to say that women's breasts are sinful and should not be seen, etc., etc. It demonizes, it demonizes sex, and I couldn't stand more firmly against that thought. Um, I don't think that um, sex should be demonised in any way, shape or form. And unfortunately, in our current media, it is incredibly badly demonised. Um, so yes, this is very sadly, Tumblr are going down the same route. Um, uh, we've had people contribute to Tumblr for the first week of every month for the last seven or since eight years, 2012, since 2012. Um, and a lot of that content will fall foul of this. So we're going to be uh, taking all our content off Tumblr uh, which is a shame. So I met the people yeah. who ran Tumblr before, one well, or three or four years ago, and they were a great bunch of people. And Tumblr has been for illustration and for uh, many people a really good source of uncensored or largely uncensored um, creativity. And I think it's a dreadful shame. I think the, the demise of Tumblr and falling to this ridiculous um, sort of morality that's pre prevalent so much in Western culture now, um, I think is awful. Um, most much in Western cultures, it's in many cultures. But I think it goes back to an almost sort of, uh, I, can't, I can't think of the word to put it, but, but sort of you know, saying to women that, that, that you know, they can't be seen breastfeeding is, is, is obscene. Um, I think that's uh, saying to women they can't show their breasts, um, that is obscene, not the showing of the breasts. Mm. Um, I, I just think that it, it goes underneath something um, which is a sort of uh, a puritanical, terrified, vision of our sexuality and our sexuality is different from each, for each one of us. It shouldn't be defined by terms, it should be defined by our feelings and we should be allowed to express as much as we want. Um, sexuality is an enormous part of what we do, of who we are. You know, we all have sexual desires, every single one of us, and they should be allowed to be expressed freely and plentifully and um, wherever we possibly can. Um, and I, I really don't see any reason to censor sexuality whatsoever. So that's my own particular take on it. Um, so there you go. I couldn't say it better myself. <laughs> Apart yeah. from a lack of sexual desires can also be, it should also be expressed. Yes, in yes, yes. Um, so jumping around, because these are just shuffles, so there's no particular order. So jumping around <laughs> to a post. Into politics. Into politics, yes. something I posted this morning in the light of all the absolute rubbish that's happening about this dreadful thing, Brexit. Um, so as we speak now in the Houses of Parliament, um, the government are trying to postpone the vote, the meaningful vote, and from tomorrow, they're trying to postpone it. Um, I think they're voting on whether they can postpone the vote. Um, it's ridiculous. I mean, as, as anybody who follows me on Instagram or probably anybody who follows Show Studio will know, I'm extremely um, anti-Brexit. I, I really couldn't be more strong in my opposition to Brexit. Um, so, that being said, um, somebody wrote to me, said, uh, what do you think can be done in the arts as individuals? Um, it's a hard question to answer. I don't, I don't know what, what you can do as individuals. I just shout as loud as I can. Um, <laughs> what I you're am, doing, probably. It's I, I'm, I'm lucky enough to get invited yeah. to 10 Downing Street once a year, or to, once a season, actually, to, to hear a, a, the, the Prime Minister deliver a kind of you know, platitude about the fashion industry. Um, and last time I went and approached <laughs> Theresa May face to face and said to her, she must not go ahead with Brexit. Um, she's a clever politi politician and sidestepped my every question. So you do what you can. 
Um, just keep on shouting about it and you know, go on the marches, protest, lobby your MP, make your voices heard in whatever you can, in whatever way you can. It, it's very hard to know what, what, what to do about it. The fashion industry is incredibly badly represented in Parliament. Um, you know, we don't have any lobby groups. You know, all the other, uh, all the other arts and all the other um, culture, you know, like the sports industry, okay. they all have huge lobby groups that go out and lobby for them. Fashion has nobody. Nobody's lobbying for fashion. And of course, the Prime Minister's got no idea what rules are going to be a problem for us or you know, what she can do, because we don't have a lobbying party. So try and get yourself involved in Parliament. Lobby your MPs. Mm. Um, it's really, really, really important that this country remains at the heart of Europe. It couldn't be more important now. There are what, five big trading blocks? You know, Russia, America, China, Europe. What's that for? Um, but, you know, we've got to be part of one of those. We, we, we can't stand as a little country as, as if we're going to be able to, to survive. I just think it's such a shame. It's the worst thing that could happen to this country. And um, so Hannah underscore by wrote, kudos for everything, but why leading? Because I said Britain should be right in the heart of, European, of Europe, leading a project. I mean, we should take an active part in it. I didn't mean to say leading in that sort of slightly kind of jingoistic sort of way. I, I meant we should be pushing to make Europe brilliant. We should be pushing to use all the resources that we have at our disposal if we're in Europe. You know, the scientific and the cultural and political and economic, all those sorts of things we should be pushing. And I'm sorry if I chose the word leading. I just meant we shouldn't be sort of taking a back seat. I think for a lot of time that we've been involved in Europe, we've dragged our feet. We've sort of, you know, this is, this is awful, um, you know, anti-Europe people, you know, Farage and what have you. They, what he's doing in ME, as an MEP, I've got no idea. They, you know, I think our relationship to Europe has been one of dragging our feet throughout most of it. Mm. And I think we should really push forward and really sort of, embrace by say it. leading, we should embrace it. We should really try and do our best. There's a great opportunity in front of us. You know, there's a huge amount of knowledge within Europe. Um, and we can do amazing things, and we should be pushing to make the most of it and not dragging our feet and making the worst of it. So, that's that particular response. Okay, that one. okay so jumping around again, this is a, a question that came in um, from Marissa underscore PH1. Um, it was about a project that we took on with the Anassis Foundation, um, with an artist called Alice Potts, who was making uh, sculptures out of people's sweat. So she'd get people to sweat into various items, um, and then she wouldn't grow crystalline structures from where the sweat was. Um, and we published a picture as part of that, which is some of some of beautiful ballet shoes. I've only got a black and white reproduction here, um, with crystals of sweat growing through them. And so Marissa underscore PH1 wrote, I'm interested in your view on the fabric industry as I struggle ideologically with the destructive nature of making clothes for the masses and magazines need to always use new clothes in mm -hmm. editorials. I try to use vintage, remade, etc., in my shoots, but this brings no interest when I submit my work as editors are only wanting to, items in order to sell. Back to my money point. Um, I choose not to do that. I think it's interesting to know what you think regards Marissa. I, I'm sorry to keep jumping in with all that, so I'll let you two answer as well. But, um, yeah, I, I agree. We, you know, we, we produce so many clothes uh, consistently more and more and more. Um, and it does seem to be unsustainable and not the way to do it. We produce cheaper and cheaper clothes. Um, it's, you know, uh, I don't know what I'm trying to say this without sounding ridiculous, but I, I have, the only clothes I wear are from, you know, I have made for me, so they are made to last. Um, and so I don't like... And don't, altered when you need it to. Yeah, I have suits which are supposed to last, for life, last a lifetime. You have a suit made on Savile Row, yes, it will cost you a lot of money, but they are, every time you put on a bit of weight, they'll let it out, or to lose weight, they'll take it in, they'll alter it, they'll clean it, they'll make it good for you, etc., etc. It's a piece of clothing designed to last, so it's a quality in the clothing. So it's worth, in my opinion, spending more money on a piece of clothing because uh, it will last um, than trying to get a cheap piece of clothing. Um, because I have more money than a lot of people and it seems to me rather disingenuous for me to sort of say that's the solution to it because, of course, most people cannot afford. So it, it's, again, it's a tricky one. A, a lot of these questions that come up are tricky because they, they have two, always two very different answers, often two very different answers to them. Um, but I absolutely recognise that the, you know, the, the, the need not to just keep on producing more and more clothes. I think probably the biggest problem is the system that allows clothes to cost less than a coffee. Mm -hmm. And I think the young generation have to understand that even if you don't have a lot of money and you can't afford luxury, you should probably consume less or buy less, not because it's one pound, which already I think it's wrong, but mm. not because it's one pound you have to buy seven or six because they're so 
many clothes, it's proven that there are billions of clothes with still a label in cupboards that people forget they yeah. have since they're so cheap. But to go back to your question about trying to shoot editorials with second-hand uh, clothes or not new mm. clothes and the magazines don't accept or nobody's interested in that, well, the problem is that magazines are commercial uh, items and they're made for the brands that invest in them to show their new collection. So no, they will never accept you your editorial and with, with all clothes. It used to be know, so different. Sure. People yeah. like Melanie Ward and Dave Sims and Nigel Sims Shaffron and Corinne yeah. Day right. and all the way back, um, you know, you know Melanie Ward was spending a whole time going around thrift shops and getting clothes. And this is the whole thing, I don't Produce know how much photos, you, yeah. you, you knew your, your sort of recent fashion history, but in the beginning of the 90s, there was a wave of new young photographers and new young designers who are now established photographers and designers. So people like Jürgen Teller and uh, Corinne Day, Dave Sims, uh, and Lutchford, you know, who are all part of a kind of, you know, let's just get the clothes from thrift shops because actually they look much better and they're more fun and they don't cost yeah. a fortune, etc., etc. And do your own hair and you don't need to wear so much makeup. And, blah, blah, blah. It was, and it was a huge success and very refreshing moment within fashion. But fashion is an interesting beast. And it's you know it's you know it works in opposites. What's in fashion today is out of fashion tomorrow. So you know there was a there was that yeah. trend we've got very big, but of course that doesn't support the fashion industry. And the fashion industry wanted something that promoted it. So you have enormously talented designers. And if people aren't buying their clothes, they won't be able to cre create their work. Mm. Um, and so that 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 particular phase stopped um, because it's it's to do with the way that the fashion industry needs to keep on reinventing itself. Fashion is a desire for things we don't have already. Um, it's my more commerce than art, yes. actually, right? Well, I don't know, Mira, I'm not, I'm not sure I'd for say For the magazines, that. I mean. For the magazines, certainly. Well, the magazines are commercial entities, yeah. which is why That's we started I mean. Show Studio. Yeah. You know, we wanted a space which wasn't, yeah. wasn't, that wasn't about that. Um, so, you know, it, it's, it's a kind of... Um, it hasn't always been so. You know, the hold the advertisers have over the editorial wells of the magazines, I think is pretty repugnant, which is why I'm not a great fan of magazines and magazine culture anymore, because I feel that I'm being conned. Um, and one of the sort of, you know, the cons I get is somebody says to me, oh, so-and-so want to do us, us to do an exclusive on their brand. And you, they try and sell that to young photographers and photographers in general, as if it's a special thing, because actually it's just advertising for that brand. Yeah. Um, Anyway, it depends who we're speaking. I don't know who you are, I'm afraid, Marissa underscore PH1. You might be a photographer or stylist or whatever you are. I guess you're a stylist from this. But I would continue to push um, the getting things from, um, from vintage shops. And whilst we're on that subject, you know, the role of a good stylist used to be that they'd get some Prada trousers and mix them with something they got from a vintage shop or something they'd made themselves. The, a stylist isn't somebody who just takes look number 25 or 25 <laughs> off the catwalk and sticks it in front of the photographer. Mm -hmm. The stylist was somebody who had style, who could invent by Made using looks. objects that they'd found or vintage yeah. clothes or bits from the collections. It was never, ever the idea of just reproducing facsimile the look that went down the catwalk. And sadly, that's where a lot of stylists find themselves now. They're expected literally, faithfully, um, bring Close the look. Yeah. And that's not just true of the, you know, that's true of a Comme de Gasson as much as it is of a Prada or any of those big brands. They insist with a sort of fist of steel that you do not mess with their clothes. Um, and I think that's wrong. And I think specifically for Comme de Gasson, that's very wrong. I think Ray really, although she sees her clothes as perfect or at least finished sculptures, or finished piece of clothing, I think she should still be open up to see how somebody turns them inside out, upside down, etc., etc., because that's the rich conversation we have in life. The idea of trying things out, of invention, etc., etc., benefits us all. Um, finite solutions are never good. Um, and this sort of uh, way of just saying, you know, this is my piece, don't touch it, is fine, but it doesn't become part of life. It doesn't become People part wear of it the way they want. Yeah. And so they should they be, wouldn't. and that's what makes it exciting. And I've always felt, and actually I felt this working with Ray, that you know, there was a conversation and was a dialogue. So it's funny when you get the PRs on the phone who say, you're absolutely not allowed to put this piece of clothing or anything else. That's sad for everybody concerned, both for the public, for the designers, for the photographers, for the stylists. That's a shame. Mm. I think we're a bit off subject, aren't we? Mm, yes and no. But I would say that whilst obviously normal fashion mediums haven't been great in supporting second-hand and vintage, direct-to-consumer things like Etsy, Depop and 
that kind of thing have been great at getting young people who like fashion, who maybe can't afford it, turn to vintage first, but creating huge marketplaces for in the know customers to mm. find exactly what they That's want. That's true. So places fashion's like Grail and Vestia Collective as well. Yeah, so I was going to say fashion changes its focus, changes away from the magazine. Um, on that point, or last point, um, I would say keep your eyes on Show Studio. Um, I won't say anything yes. more than that, but there is something brewing at Show Studio which deals exactly to that point. Yes. Anyway, on to another question. Um, this is about um, some roses I've just exhibited in Tokyo, um, and somebody called Laura Godbolt um, <laughs> so wrote to me, could you share with us if there is any retouch um, stroke post-production done to your roses from my garden images, and if so, what? They're shot on my iPhone, here's my iPhone, they're shot on my iPhone, and I simply put them through Instagram filters, that's all. Um, there's no more post or no less post than that. Um, I sit in my kitchen and I photograph roses when they're in, when they're in season, and I um, spend hours just photographing them, usually at weekends, on my iPhone, um, and then I just put them through Instagram filters. And, Publish them. Um, so, so no retouching? Well, there's no, filter. other than the filters of Instagram, no, there's, there's totally don't go to Photoshop or anything like that. It's partly to have that accessibility, so I could, somebody's Sorry. at the door. Um, so it's partly to have that accessibility. Um, so I'm just going to see if I can, whilst I'm I talking. Think, sorry, I think one script. thing, you do put them through Instagram, but you, what Nick Welfin does is take them through multiple times. So he'll screenshot it when it's got one photo on it and then take and then take the screenshotted one back into Instagram, put a different photo, a different level on sometimes, it. Sometimes, Callum, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not like always. Often. Sometimes it's just a filter. Some, no, no, but it's usually not, it's it's through Instagram, but I'm just saying yes. sometimes there are multiple layers, different lightnesses. So I think you do still apply the modern way of image making through Instagram, which it is a simple you know, Instagram is a simplified Photoshop in a lot of ways. You can create masks or you know, very simple ways, but you can create filters, masks, all of that. Yeah. So, I was going to try something. This is, this is a, a, from my last rose I photographed, and you can see it, but I don't know if you I can see I don't know if they can see it. Well, who knows? Maybe you can <laughs> that's see. That's the same photo. That's the yeah. same Hundreds set of times, roses. Yeah. So, it, it's, you know, that's sort of. It shows how many it takes before finding the perfect one. But I don't, um, I don't put them through any other filters than the Instagram filters. And to be honest, if I put them through filters, it's usually, I can tell you, just so you know if you want to know. Um, it's usually, let me just stick a filter through, one second, sorry, this is slightly tedious for everybody who doesn't care about this. You're telling which filter you use? Yeah, normally it's um, Hudson, and then I'll go down um, from Hudson and I'll take the brightness dark, or so I'll take the brightness down, and I'll take the contrast down. So that's normally the, the route I go. If it looks rubbish, because sometimes it does, I go to another filter and just play around like I get it. So it's not really more complicated than that. Um, well, it I've, makes this look easy, but you know. <laughs> no, well, it's also the way he puts the roses and the composition back. Um, so, very quickly, still on the roses, somebody's written uh, on my Instagram, I posted that. Um, will there be a book to go with a show about the show in Tokyo? Mm, that's which a good question. finishes this week, actually, I think. It does already. Yeah, I think yeah. On for a And we're on the last week. Mm -hmm. end so, of the if, if you want to go and see the, the show of um, my roses, it's on at the Mass Gallery in Tokyo. Um, will there be a book? Yes, there will be a book, not to go with the show, but there'll be a, I'm working on a book of my roses. Um, the reason I haven't released it and I was reluctant to release it is because if I release it this year, next year I'm still going to want to photograph roses. <laughs> um, so I've sort of been hanging on year in, year out to try and hold back from doing it. Because I always think, well, next year I'll devote a whole month or two months just sitting at home photographing roses as they bloom. Um, that hasn't happened yet. But um, and there will be a book and I'm working on it now. Maybe that come. Um, still on roses, still about this question. Um, somebody called, I can't pronounce this, A T L E S Q U E. Atlesk. Atlesk. I would say, yeah. Um, it says, it's amazing how many roses you have in your garden. Did you take a course in gardening? Oh, that's um, a good one. <laughs> um, no, I hate to sort of debunk all these. I didn't take a course in gardening, and I'd love to. Had I got another life, I could do something else in. Um, I simply buy my roses often from. <gasps> My memory's so bad. What's the name of the rose grower? I haven't been for years. <laughs> I'll have to put that in later. Anyway, I simply buy my roses from one of the best rose growers in, in, in Britain, probably in the world. And, um, and I have them on my terrace. They're not even planted in the garden. They're, and they're not they're, florist roses? They're certainly not florist roses. They tend to be um, uh, garden roses, uh, hybrid tea roses, they're called. But they're um, planted, they're still the plant. They're right? still in the, in the, in the pot. In the pot. In. They're not planted in the garden. My garden is all ivy and silver birches, and I have a sort of central terrace that the house wraps around. 
David Austin. David Austin. Austin. We think David Austin. Back, backs off screen is giving me hints. <laughs> David Austin. David Austin. Great. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Huge plug. Um, so the normally from David Austin, he does um, the most beautiful scented um, roses, hybrid tea roses that are incredible. So I get a lot of my roses from there. Um, and sadly, I don't have any great knowledge of gardening or anything else. Just um, give but them more to one but he's a great photographer. That's why everybody thinks he has such a great garden of roses. Actually, there are not that many. It just makes them look amazing. Well, they're, right. they're, they're very beautiful things to photograph. It's more about photographing than gardening. So, um, so a little bit of a question that came out again from the Jordan Vickers uh, Best in Show. And somebody called James Welsh, underscore, has written, gross, we'll stop. Virgil is a plagiarist whose praise should be going to new talented artists who actually design and work with their craft, not plagiarists. I, I, I can't agree, I'm sorry, um, and I try not to sound defensive and aggressive. <laughs> I like Virgil a lot. I knew him when he was with Kanye, when he was Kanye's art directors. There was Virgil and there was Matt Williams, who were both either side of Kanye as their art directors. And they started um, looking into fashion, as Kanye did. And uh, they got inspired by it. And to some degree, they've ushered a new generation um, of fashion designers and new ways of looking at fashion. And it's using existing fashion. We talked about a, 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 you know, you know, using fashion that's already there, recycling, all those sorts of things. It's part of their, part of their process is to look at clothes that already exist. Um, and I think Virgil will be the first person to, to, you know, to admit that he gets ideas from, from the world around him. And I think that's a, a, a new, it feels to be a new way of working, and I don't think um, it's fair in any way to call, call Virgil a plagiarist. Um, I think he's an incredibly inventive and important designer, and he's marking our times, and he's bringing in a new wave of people into the fashion world, um, which is incredibly important. People who really thought it wasn't anything to do with them before, they thought it was the sort of, you know, an area they couldn't succeed in. And I think he's trailblazing in that way. You know, he's at the head of one of the biggest houses now. You know, he's an incredibly successful young man. Um, and I think that success opens doors for other people. Mm. Um, and so to dismiss what he does because he references, um, I, th I, I think it's wrong. Sorry, can you reach into I also think that he is a lot more open with his referencing, whereas mm. all designers reference have, they get in old versions of clothes, you know, though if some, you know, designers will be pulling in, these are cold old sneakers that I'm wearing to reference for their boots next season, but you won't necessarily know, but. Um, Virgil is incredibly open with his yeah, references, which is what's so great about him, but obviously that gets levered against him. And also spending time with Virgil, which I've done on different occasions, which have different jobs, uh, it's like a whirlwind of ideas, it's like a cyclone. There's all these things getting mashed together, all these different people that he's around, surrounds himself by, and all these different things that he's seeing, that he's interested in, it's art, it's music, it's all of this stuff. And it is, you know, it is a mashup of these things, and it's quote unquote easier to understand and the references are more available to everyone but I don't think that makes that Ooh. is something to be levied against him I think in a way that's very democratic all and fashion. something exciting about him so all fashion designers reference um, I oh. remember you know, some of the most beautiful clothes I worked with with Yoji Yamamoto was for a, a collection he did inspired by Dior's collection one, you know, Christian Dior's early collections um, because these are important references it's a conversation when you create an image or when you create a dress, it's a conversation. You put it out there, somebody sees it and responds. You know, I see when I produce a body of work. So I say I do a series of 10 photographs or a fashion film, and it goes out there on YouTube, on Show Studio, on Instagram, etc., etc. Then you will see in the months that follow, people who have taken references from that and turned it around their way and done it their thing. And I look back at those and it's a conversation that goes on. And the same is true of any of the creative arts. You know, we will all respond to, to the things we see. You know, um, Jordan Wolfson, who's just incredibly popular and trendy artist, I don't mean that really, but very popular artist at the moment. He's having a lot of recognition. Getting a lot of recognition at the moment. You know, his work will influence other artists. Um, and they will pick it up, you know, some more wholesale than others, but, you know, that's part of it, and they will take it a step further. So I think, you know, we, we shouldn't be, we really shouldn't jump on these fairly unpleasant um, ways of, 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 of talking about people and say, oh, he's a plagiarist. Um, he's very open with his referencing, all designers reference, um, and some more openly than others, and Virgil is changing how fashion is, and it's opening those doors which were previously pretty firmly closed to a lot of people, he's opening those wide up, and it's, fashion is changing. Look at how Kanye reacted to him um, on, on the, when he presented in Paris. You know, 
they felt they'd achieved something, and I'm completely with them on that. They have achieved something. They've made fashion broader, more accessible, more diverse. You know, that all the positive things they bring. So to simply turn around and say he's a plagiarist, we shouldn't, um, we shouldn't entertain him. I think is is really, in my opinion, really misunderstanding him. Mima, do you want to say anything on that? No, I just want to add that I think it's a little bit of a pity that in the digital era, people, whenever someone is so successful so fast, instead mm. of saying thank you, you're opening door for other people, you're showing things, people are attacked and it happens very often and I think that's a sad thing. So I agree with whatever you two said, but especially I think the most important thing about Virgil and Virgil at Vuitton is the meaning of what happened there mm. and that will go down in history yeah. and yeah. that for me is important. Yeah. Okay, well, let's move on. Back so, to politics. <laughs> back to politics, well, <laughs> probably. Um, this is from uh, Mimi Jones. Um, and this is something when I got stopped on my way into town um, and uh, by people who were protesting about um, the appalling state that our planet's got into, and quite rightly were they were protesting it. And she wrote, um, uh, little, little, uh, I can't quite decipher it, says, Nick, no, and then sad face. I love how you use your platform on here to speak out and do good, but I was disappointed to read you encouraging people to vote green. Our only chance of ousting the Tories is Labour. Um, yes, no. <laughs> it's um, an opinion. It's an opinion. Uh, I'd, want, I'd love to see the Tories out of power, I, I, but I don't, I don't think the Labour Party is necessarily the, the solution um, to the mess our, our planet's in. And I'm very sorry that I don't think that. Um, <laughs> I, I find it very hard to vote at all anymore, um, to be honest. Where I live, which is in Richmond, there's no chance of the Labour Party getting in whatsoever, so it's a totally wasted vote, um, even if I wanted to vote Labour. Um, and, you know, the only party I'd be voting for is the Green Party, because, you know, all said and done, we can have however much money we want, but if we're, if we're you know, if the planet is catching fire and the water levels are rising, it doesn't matter how much money you've got to, to most, you know, we're ruining our planet. We, have to do something about it and that that comes or should come before any party uh, political allegiances. I think the Tories have absolutely shot themselves in the foot so much they shouldn't be standing anymore. That, you know, they're, they're a disgraced party in my opinion and I'm very upset with how they've behaved. Um, and I think the Labour Party do not for me provide an alternative or much, how much I love the aesthetic, not the aesthetic, sorry, <laughs> the, the, the idea behind the Labour Party that it's for the underprivileged, it's for the poor and of course I want to see our prisons you know, made decent for people, not like Victorian, um, you know, holes. holes you, you know, people need re rehabilitating, they need chance. So I absolutely am toe to toe with what the Labour Party believe with that. I believe we should be investing in our schools, we should be investing in, our, in the, uh, the eldest generation in our societies, we should be looking for the poor, the weak, the sick, all that's absolutely yes. But I don't believe necessarily that the way this Labour Party is, is the right answer. Now I know I'm going to attract a lot of vitriol for that comment, but I, you can't just expect me to just say things I don't believe, and this is part of doing um, this answer me, I think, is for me to be honest to you. Um, so yes, I voted Green, and I will continue to vote Green, because in the end, for me, that's the most single most important factor in everything we have in front of us. Um, but second to that, um, my own personal opinion is that this country and the world, but this country, especially because where I live in, needs to look after the people who are more vulnerable, um, you know, the mentally ill, the... Um, you know, the, the, the poor, the weak, all, all, all of those need a strong society is a society that protects the people who are the weakest within that society. Um, Callum. Well, just to add to that, that these two things, kind of the environment and looking after poor, shouldn't be political lines to be taken, no, they should be true. givens. They shouldn't be things that you have to choose between. They should just be part of, but unfortunately that's not the society we're in at the moment. Mima, any thoughts? Well, I have many. I can't vote in this country because I'm not. Yeah. I was Swiss. British, um, and I come from a country that voted no to Europe twice when I was young, so mm -hmm. um, I've been through that. But anyway, I, no, I just want to add something again about uh, when you said I'm going to get a lot of vitriol for what I just said. I think that everybody's entitled to an opinion. Your opinion is very clear, very open, very consistent with what you do, so don't attack someone for what they vote. Just mm -hmm. express your opinion. but. You see what I mean? It's yeah. just we need to tolerate other people's opinion unless, you know, unless they're extreme and, and evil. But I mean, saying I would like to vote green is not a bad thing. 
I'm, I'm, I won't profess to be enormously politically educated. I studied science and I studied the arts. I didn't study politics. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have all that information at my fingertips. I couldn't tell you a lot of the political situations in the mm. world, how they arose or how they were arising. So I don't have that. On a slightly lighter note, um, to that end, Bobby Gillespie um, sends me <laughs> things to read. Bobby Gillespie, who is very firmly in, uh, in favour of the Labour Party, will send me nearly every other day, uh, well, often, things sort of... A reading list. A reading list <laughs> of things to read, often from The Guardian, but from other, other, other publications. As I, I was just driving into town, and um, just at the bottom of the, of the sort of, just after Hammersmith flyover, um, there was a, just sort of, there's a big Sainsbury's on the left hand side for those who know that road. And then, literally in front of my car, these protesters came in front of the car and, and put up their placards and stopped all the traffic. They were super lovely and polite and very sweet. <laughs> and I sat there in my Bentley looking at them. Uh, I'm feeling totally guilty for having a Bentley. Um, and, but they were not in any way aggressive and they were carrying signs that said, sorry, we won't be long. And they were, they were very, very sweet, but they wanted to make a really important point. Anyway, to that note, Melissa on the road wrote, at Nick Knight, this photo was taken from inside a car, question mark. Yes, yeah, it was. Um, a bit ironic. These people are trying to bring awareness to our habits, mainly about our oil economic, mainly about our oil, economic and vehicle constructors all these myths that driving makes us more manly, powerful, independent, just myths, public transport work fine in London. Again, I, I find myself skewered on my own hypocrisy or, or, or guilt or anything, any way you want to put it. Yeah, I was driving a, a Bentley, which isn't a particularly uh, good green fuel um, or a green car, whatever it is. So yeah, I'm absolutely guilty. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say. I wouldn't be honest. Yes, I shouldn't have been driving a car. I, I'm not sure how I'd be able to work without driving a car. And you can say, well, you can get into town on the tube and on your bicycle or whatever, which you probably can't. Um, all those sort of things. In theory, yes. In practice, trying to get lots of photographic equipment across the tube doesn't make you very popular. And I used to do it. Um, I can remember back in the 1980s when I first started trying to get kits of what are called redheads, which are lights. Um, which are about the size of a coffin um, and uh, a colour armour through the uh, uh, Oxford Circus underground at uh, 9.30 in the morning. I wasn't very popular. Um, so we often carry a lot of equipment. Um, not always in the Bentley, but we often carry a lot of equipment. It's very hard to do. Uh, you know, it's one of those things you, sometimes in life you just think, well, yeah, I'm, I am wrong. I shouldn't be doing this. Um, I'm not quite sure how to stop. And nobody else is stopping. Why should I? All those sorts of really honest, well, no, sorry, all those sorts of really human reactions to these problems. But yeah, it, it, it is something that I think is, is, is very, very, very worrying. We are ruining this planet. This is a strange one. I've got no idea even how to start to this one. This is from um, an Ask Me Anything, um, which is with Callum, Rob, my assistant, and myself. And Mirabel Starfish, of course. Uh, Mirabel Starfish asks, Hi Nick, please can you answer what you find sexy and how you would describe sexy? I know it's an overused term, so it's so interesting what is sexy. I'm not even sure I should be answering that question. Um, what if I, a whole range of things are. What, why are you looking around the corner like that, Rob? <laughs> what you? Oh, he's trying to finish. Say, okay. <laughs> okay. So, um, no, come. I'm not going to say me. Um, this is really sexy. Lots of things are sexy in lots of different ways, depending on the context, depending on who you are, and depending on who you're with. I don't. Let me finish. I don't think there's any one thing which is sexy. There are many things which are sexy. Um, I think we are sexual beings of not any particular um, fixed um, direction. Um, I think we can be uh, having a relationship with the same sex person or a different sex person. I think the same. I think everything seen in, the, in that light can be sexual. People find sexuality in a whole range of things, from the smoothness of material to um, certain colours that are used to smells to. Um, positions of power, positions of lack of power, all those things can be sexual. Um, our world is sexual um, from beginning to end. So with a rather bad answer to your question, um, what do you find sexy? I think everything can be sexual. Can be. It's also not a word you use. No, it's, it's not, not a word that I ever hear you pertain, or anyone really at social media use to describe anything that we do, whether it could be a very explicit film, it is not a word that is used in... Oh, what is that after? The boss is after yeah. he has to stop. No, okay, I'm going to stop this. I'll be very quickly. Very, very um, last one. Um, did a little bit of a look. Uh, I went to see the, the Klimt and Sheila show mm. at the Royal Academy of Arts. 
and I wasn't very impressed with it. And they said, why disappointing? I thought the show was too small, that it shouldn't have been uh, put on in any case because it was not enough volume of work and people were being charged £18 to go and see it. I have a cultivist card, which means that um, I don't get a chance to go and see things because I, bought a, well, I was given a cultivist card. I can take, take three members in for free. So if everybody wants to come to an exhibition with me on Saturday afternoons, just give me a shout. Um, anyway, I thought, it was, I thought it was a very disappointing exhibition. Whoops. I thought it was a very disappointing exhibition, and um, they really need to um, think a little bit more carefully before they throw on a huge exhibition to amazing artists like Klimt and Egon Schiele. They need the work to support that. And I thought the Royal Academy looked tatty and shabby, uh, and I think that although they apparently had work done to it, it really didn't look good. I was depressed and saddened by the exhibition, and I thought, you know, these are two of the fav my first favourite artists, and I'm not impressed coming out, and that's a shame. Um, Peter Warwick, photographer, said, Nick Knight, um, any chance we could have some more show tech, please? Um, yes, Peter Warwick, photographer, there yeah. is. It's we're working on one now. Um, we're going to do uh, one on the uh, Rihanna cover I did for Vogue. There we go. Sorry. Thank you it's very much. It's in the calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.